Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this uh, In Conversation from Spring and Nature. I am Magdalena Skipper, Editor-in-Chief of Nature, and I'm really delighted to be talking today with David Navarro. So David is best known as a special envoy on COVID-19 for the WHO. He's also co-director and chair of Global Health at the Institute of Global Health Innovation at Imperial College, and also a strategic director for um, 4SD, Skills, Systems and Synergies for Sustainable Development. Um, David, welcome. You and I actually met in the context of another uh, passion of yours, and that's specifically food systems transformation. And um, I know that back in 2018, you were actually a co-recipient of the World Food Prize, which some consider to be, to be Nobel Prize for Agriculture. And that was specifically on your leadership in evaluating the um, maternal child under nutrition. To what extent that work is still going on now? As you say, when we came together uh, and got to know each other, I was working a lot on child nutrition and then on food and links between food systems and nutrition. And that has become a passion because I think over the years, I've become more and more conscious that I'm really a systems thinker and I suppose at times also a systems leader. As I've been working on climate, working on nature, working on food and hunger, and indeed working on public health, I've found that inevitably, if we try to influence one particular aspect of human activity by a, a specific intervention, it's inevitable that other aspects of, of human existence are going to be disturbed by that intervention and that in turn will lead to consequences that were not easily anticipated when we started and that in turn means that we cannot view any effort to try to stimulate a, a more sustainable and equitable future for humanity simply by saying I've got a problem, I'm going to deal with it with a very specific solution and then the job will be done. There's a really interesting and important lesson in what you say for, for research and the research community itself and by extension, I think, for us at Nature. So, of course, as a multidisciplinary journal, in our um, focus, there are all the different disciplines that are under the research umbrella. But I think for too long, we have taken this multidisciplinarity in a, in a siloed, from a siloed perspective, and it's only recently that we are in earnest embracing interdisciplinarity. And I think that systems thinking and systems leadership you talk about lies at the heart of interdisciplinarity. Do you have advice for me, for us at Nature, for how to become successful at that? And by extension, do you have advice for researchers how to embrace that? After all, that's not how we, we train. We still continue to train in a siloed fashion. Working in the policy space with, with governments particularly, I'm finding that the one thing they need from the scientific community is genuine interdisciplinarity, a genuine interest in working with the separate disciplines, for example, uh, medicine and biochemistry and uh, management and social sciences, particularly anthropology and sociology. And that, but they don't want to feel that as policy people, they somehow have to arbitrate between the different disciplines and work out some kind of uh, amalgam that suits them. They want the scientists themselves to come to them and say, we've been working out how to align our different disciplines and offer a perspective that's useful for policymakers because we as scientists would like to be able to do that. We think that's part of 
our responsibility in the science policy interface. I actually think it is the responsibility of the scientist, particularly the scientist that's in university, to find ways to build bridges between scientific disciplines in ways that make that work relevant to people working in policy in a way before they come out of their universities. That's part of the responsibility of the scientific community. So it's also really the responsibility of the journal as well. And um, actually, I have to say, Magdalena, I look at what you do in the nature family of journals and I see you making incredible efforts to be uh, interdisciplinary yourselves and then to offer to policy makers an amalgam. You are always admitting that you've had to put your own biases into that process, but at least you're trying to do it. Thank you for recognising our efforts in this direction already. Uh, we absolutely see an opportunity there and of course I can speak for nature, but I think there's a broad, broad opportunity for Springer Nature, but other, the whole of um, uh, science publishing uh, landscape. And I completely agree with you that there has to be a collaboration. So at that table, this cannot be a conversation that's driven by policymaker or any other single stakeholder. Different stakeholders need to come uh, to the table uh, to agree on the priorities and actually to, 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 to make uh, progress. And this actually brings me specifically to something that I know you've led for the last couple of years, um, possibly even actually longer, maybe four years or so, um, that I particularly admire, and that's your food systems dialogue. So in the context, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the motivation was in the run-up to the UN Food Systems Summit, which of course took place last year. Um, and it's this amazing grassroots initiative. Um, tell us a bit more about this. How did it come about? And, and actually, what I'm really curious about is, is that example being cloned and followed in other contexts? Inside food systems, there are multiple inbuilt tensions. And I think that most of us know something about these tensions simply because it's part of our daily business as we make our choices about food. In and around the Food Systems Summit, the tensions around meat as an issue were strong and indeed reached the point where they were made manifest in points made by national governments when they were commenting on the design of the summit. So that's one area. Another area is the asymmetry of power relations in, in the food sector with the recognition that there's an awful lot of power actually in the hands of a relatively small number of corporations and the leaders of those corporations. One key approach that we built into the dialogues just slightly differed from the way you introduced us. We accepted that there will be issues on which agreement is not possible, that stakeholders need to be prepared to accept that they don't agree, but that acceptance of non-agreement doesn't mean that the stakeholders then try to torpedo any discussion about how systems could shift in the future. And we, so we've kept this going, Magdalena, after the summit, still continuing with dialogues in a good proportion of the countries that started with dialogues before the summit and it's gone further and actually this is now the basis of efforts to shift systems in about a hundred countries around the world all around this basic principle of we accept the reality that people don't agree that's part of the basis of how we work we don't try to straitjacket people into a single pattern of thought and a single pattern of behavior. So I, it's so fascinating, David. I, as I say, I, I have found this as, a, as an example to, to possibly, uh, as I said, clone, maybe with modifications in other, in other contexts. And you know, we have plenty of other examples where we are faced with a global issue which needs local solutions in order to be successful. And again, in order to be successful, needs a buy-in 
from a wide variety of stake stakeholders, including um, the, the broadest society. And of course, very neatly, we can um, lift this example and try and fit it, for example, in, against the way that we have on a global scale have tried to tackle the pandemic. Yeah. And of course, that's something else that you have been very focused yeah. on over the last over the last two years. This engagement, this space for trying to find local solutions and perhaps voicing differences of opinion, to my perspective, from my perspective, hasn't quite worked in the context of the pandemic. I mean, do you see that that's been a, a missed opportunity? What, what, what is your thought on that? The basis of the way in which we've been working on the Food Summit and indeed on the COVID-19 pandemic <laughs> is just starting from an acceptance that it's okay if, if people, groups, organisations, countries, businesses or any other group of actors disagree. Disagreement is okay. But if we're going to be comfortable with disagreement and with the tensions that are associated with that, then we would also need narratives that enable those who disagree to at least feel comfortable about the way in which their positions are expressed. And we need arrangements for bringing people together, for networking, that do not discriminate against people who hold particular perspectives, especially if those are minority perspectives. We're still not right on it, and it's got particularly difficult on COVID, but it starts something like this. Let's have a narrative with a series of principles and a series of things that we believe there's collective agreement on and use that as our starting point. And then when it becomes clear that there is a tension and a disagreement, instead of trying to resolve the tension by one group sort of hectoring the other, perhaps even somehow um, dismissing the positions of the others and, and you ending up with a conflict, we say move into dialogue mode and accept that there's a difference of opinion and talk about it. Sometimes when we talk about science, we forget that it's not immutable. In fact, it's not like a religion. It does change, it does evolve. It evolves its position and its views, um, absolutely. In the context of uh, COVID, there are a couple of other specific things that I wanted to touch on with you. Um, one, um, an obvious one, which we have covered a lot in, um, in the pages of Nature, and you have, of course, spoken about as well, and that is the future of equitable access to vaccines. Um, much of the conversations has fo focused on um, sharing um, vaccines developed uh, in the global north. That conversation has shifted uh, in more recent times to um, campaigns for um, uh, effectively alleviating um, uh, patents and sharing uh, the technology and followed, followed with uh, establishment of infrastructure so that these vaccines can be developed um, uh, in many more countries. What, in your view, is the most likely path to be successful? I mean, now, now we're talking about second generation vaccines. Can we think of a new way of um, designing and developing vaccines so from the get go, they become um, more likely to be equitable, equitably um, available? For me, it was quite obvious from the beginning that the vaccines have been shown to prevent severe illness and death among particular people. But I suddenly found that the way I saw things was just miles away from the way in which many government or regional leaders were seeing things. And particularly when some quite extraordinary debates to then develop between people in uh, the European Union and people in the UK government about relative priority for vaccines to be made available to this group or that group or the other group. For me, I just thought, well, oh, it's, it's, 
it's blindingly obvious that the right way to handle the vaccines is to have a system to, to make sure that they are g given in on a as needed basis and as ready basis to countries so that everybody everywhere who was at risk of this disease could get the vaccines in order to prevent them from likely uh, or possible death and that that would be just the way in which the world would move forward and so then as I watched a quite significant hoovering up of vaccine capacity often at a better price than what was the price being offered by those working on behalf of poor nations I suddenly saw this skewing going on in the early months of 2021 and and the way I reacted to it was a sort of sense of outrage. How can this happen? And then I had to stop. And I had to say to myself, no. It's clear that they have been elected by their populations uh, in, in general elections. And they see their primary responsibility is to the people who voted for them rather than to the whole world. And so then I would say things like, well, I've never known of a uh, outbreak or a pandemic where the pathogen stops nicely at the borders of a country and then you can operate within those borders and keep things cleaned up and hold it back and it just doesn't work like that in public health if we can't ha have in, have world leaders working together in a systematic way on something that's quite tangible like the pandemic what hope have we got for working together in, in an equity, equitable way on the impacts of climate change? What hope have we got of working together on the impacts of loss of nature? And so now what I'm saying is that I hope the analyses of the responses to the pandemic that will be conducted in the next uh, decade, I suppose, I hope that they will dissect out the costs and consequences of decision makers operating within quite narrow jurisdictions for what is going to be needed for dealing with these big existential challenges in future. And so how hopeful are you? I mean, I know that a few years back, you actually led an effort within WHO to sort of review um, its response to um, epidemics and, and emergencies. Do are you are you optimistic about how capable we are of learning from our past experiences? You know, we know that it's very likely that another pandemic will come at some stage. Of course, pandemics periodically uh, occur in in human populations. Do you think we have learned enough from one another's responses? I think that we could do a lot better than we do at the moment particularly through the kind of ideas that I mentioned earlier on systems thinking and interdisciplinarity. So I'm hugely optimistic about the innate potential of humanity. And, and I believe that the more diversity there is in groups, the more potential there is for really extraordinary capabilities to emerge. However, will that be permitted or will anxiety by people who work in control of specific scientific disciplines or specific institutions like universities or specific nations will that sense of we've got to keep things tight we've got to limit the degree of cooperation in order to maintain our superiority will that somehow override this innate capacity of humans to do amazing things through working together. So I'm optimistic, but at the same time, I'm a bit realistic that there are a few hitches that we have to get through right now. David, thank you very much. Um, this was really tremendous, really enjoyable um, and, and very informative. Really great to have an insight into, into your thinking and to have your perspective so honestly shared with us. Thank you. Thank you for what you do and for your leadership. Thank you.